This is the Colonel Rad Alert. Civil defense information will be broadcast at 640. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Y2K. How can we prepare? Stop a few of their machines and radios. Throw them into darkness for a few hours. We are fighting for our lives. My family must survive. Over five years, thousand gallons of gas, air filtration, water filtration. Coming at you from the frozen tundra that is East Central Alberta, Canada. Streaming live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, Rumble, and Odyssey. Welcome back to the workshop where we create community, find freedom, promote preparedness, and share success. I am Toolman Tim. Today is August the 13th, 2023. This is episode 353 of Workshop Radio. How the hell is everyone out there this evening? Fine, fine summer evening. In just a minute, we're going to bring my guest on, Spags, from Spags Unfiltered and a whole bunch of other things. But before we do, let's get the announcements out of the way. First off, guys, it's Sunday evening, so that means our sponsor is Amy Dingman of A Farmer's Kind of Life. She has the most incredible podcast. She's been doing it a lot longer than I have. She is an expert at telling you what you need to hear while smiling and making you feel good about it. So give her some support, guys. I say it all the time, but if you need to fill your ear holes with more inspiration, her podcast is the way to go. So add A Farmer's Kind of Life to your podcast catcher and go from there. Okay, from there, guys, we have an in-person workshop meetup at Nate and Aaron's house in Illinois. If you want to know the super secret location for it, I will let you know. If you come and join the Telegram group, which uh, the link is in the description, it's going to be on September, Saturday, September the 16th. Uh, if you show up, you'll get a super secret piece of workshop swag. But more than that, it's just going to be a cool time to get together, fellowship, hang out with like-minded folk. Because as I told you before, the first time I went to Nicole's spring workshop, there is incredible power in getting together with people whom you are like-minded with. Doesn't mean you agree on everything. It just means you agree on the important things and the rest falls into place. And finally, you know what? If you want to hang out with all the cool kids, come by and join the Telegram group uh, with your fellow workshop delinquents. If you haven't come, to, <clears throat> please make sure you do because it is absolutely the place to hang out. Uh, we get new people from just about every single episode and uh, you need help, come by, post it, and we will tell you how to go, where to go, how to get there, and all the rest. So with that, let's bring on... Hey, Spags, how are you, brother? What's going on, buddy? How are you? Good. How's the weather in Kansas? You know, it's raining. It just downpoured all over my house. I just trimmed up the tree in my front yard yesterday, so my deck took a beating, but it's oh. okay. It, well, the rain will wash it off now, won't it? Well, you know, that's right. Free cleaning. In theory. <laughs> so we, we've we yet to meet in person, but we've met online many times and have many mutual friends at this point. Mm -hmm. So tell everyone who a Spags is, who you are, where you came from, First job in high school, you know, that kind of stuff. All right. Well, my name is Bobby Spaggs. I'm a, uh, an Aries. I like long walks on the beach. I dislike dishonest women, and I love puppies. Past that, uh, I've been in the preparedness arena since 1997. Been here a long, long time. Have a lot of uh, really cool stories to tell. A lot of really neat people I've met over that period. Um Years ago, I owned a company or I was an owner in a company called Kansas Prepper Expo, and we put on a whole bunch of uh, uh, preparedness expos here across Kansas, and then that morphed into full-spectrum preparedness when prepper became a dirty word, and we thought maybe from a marketing standpoint, using preparedness was better. Now I work with uh, Midwest Preparedness Project. Patrick and myself uh, run Midwest Preparedness Project with a host of characters from Kansas and Missouri that come in and volunteer and help us to put it on. And so, yeah, we just continue to preach the message of preparedness, of community, of building your tribe and all of those different things. Um, a lot of times people will ask you, well, what's your qualifications to talk about these things? And uh, Army for 16 years as a military police officer. Uh, I did contract mercenary work for four years. I did military contracting for three more years I worked for the United States House of Representatives for a senior member of Congress as a caseworker for eight years and construction, guns, all that stuff along the way. And over the last five to six years, I've added the homesteading element to what I do 
So gardening, some birds, livestock, uh, canning, all the stuff that most preppers tend to overlook immediately, which I did myself. So from a uh, perspective of lots of things I've learned not to do, I would say that uh, I have no problem telling you what I've done that I've learned works. So military police, what was that like? <laughs> Statist AF. <laughs> um, yeah, the, it's all right. There's there's no mistaking where I lie now with my sure. the color the colors I fly. But look, I, I would never take it back. Um, I gained right. a lot of experience. I saw a lot of things. You know, I deployed to Iraq. I have a couple of other deployments under my belt. A lot of life lessons learned. Um, I would never give it up. But um, I'm not quite the same guy I was when I was 19, 20. I don't have the bloodlust I once had or the death wish for that matter. And now I'm more of a anarchist who believes more in peaceful coexistence with my fellow man, provided you just don't piss me off or I don't piss you off. It's pretty easy. I'm a firm believer in, I, I live life with zero regret, absolutely yep. zero. Yep. And I'm a firm believer in wherever you are now is exactly where you're supposed to be. And every choice you made brought you to where you are. So yeah, no judgment, brother, because yep. if you knew where I came from and where I'm at, that's a whole different, whole different story. story. So. Yeah, I, I think it's easier for guys like me who have who have been under the thumb and under the uh, rule of government and under the employee of government mm. for as much of my life as I was to become an anarchist. Because it's one thing to be the cheerleader on the outside, rah, 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 go team, wave the flag. Yeah, bomb those guys over there. Yeah, drill for oil over there. Yeah, let my banks rape your banks and be a team player, right? Yeah. But when you start to get away from that team mentality and realize that the individual should trump the team at all times, that's when you start to really see, man, it's easy for me now to come out of statism into that anarchist mindset because I literally was the other side for so long. Dude, so many things I want to ask you about that. But can I, I heard the M word in there, mercenary. Am I allowed to ask a question about that or not? Sure. So how did, how did that come about? And can you tell any, I mean, you, whatever you're comfortable with, but wow. I don't think I've ever spoke to somebody that had <clears throat> done that before. So how does that work? There was a, there was a good time in my life. I didn't talk about it. Um, okay. Most of what I did was child recovery. And the reason I started talking about it publicly was because during the Me Too movement, when I was still on Facebook, a friend of mine posted something that led to an argument. And some gal got on there spouting Me Too, believe her bullshit. And so I jumped on and I was like, well, what have you ever actually done to combat sexual predators or to stop human trafficking? And of course, well, uh, post things for social awareness online, to which... But that little lever in the back of my head snapped. And I was like, you know what? This is why you never send a woman to do a man's work. And I said that on purpose because it was some sure. gal posting that shit. And I said it to be edgy. But at the end of the day, that's pretty much why I'll talk about it openly now. You know, it was very boring in the beginning. I did diamond escorts, money escorts, personal security details for rich people's daughters at college, that sort of thing. But the cool thing, the reason why mercenary work in my mind is better than military work is because you get to pick what you do and you have the ability to say no. Uh, a professional soldier, which I also was, doesn't have the ability to say no. So I got to pick and choose what I did. And over time, I got into child recovery where I helped combat human trafficking, mostly in the southwest of the United States, a little bit up in the northeast, but mostly in the southwest places in uh, Nevada that are hot spots for that, Arizona. Um, and, uh, I saw way more hairy shit doing that than I ever did in 16 years in the army. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. So how, okay. I know, okay. This is, I know lots of ex-military who are preppers that, that mindset kind of makes sense, but I'd like to know how you get into that, but also have you, okay. The whole prepper mindset tends toward, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but overall tends a little more to the conservative side of things. Huh? Sure. So it's kind of fun when you go to prepper events that are more right-leaning mm -hmm. to, to, you know, toot the anarchy horn. So how did those two, how did those two aspects of your life develop? <laughs> well, when I owned Kansas Prepper Expo with my buddies that ran it with me and then full spectrum preparedness, I was, that was about the time that was post Iraq for me. And Iraq okay. is really what pulled the rug out from under my feet. You know, I was 
When I went to Iraq, I was a Ronald Reagan could do no wrong. George Bush is a fucking God. Let's bomb everything brown with a beard and settle this shit once and for all guy. A year after being in Iraq, that completely changed. And I realized everything's a lie. None of this is true. The reasons we're here is a lie. I watched the house of cards fall down around me. And it was a very, a very tumultuous time for me because I thought I had my tribe. I thought I had my flag and I bled red, red, white, and blue, the whole nine yards. And um, so after Iraq, when we started the whole prepper, um, Kansas prepper expo, it was a very odd time because you're right. 95% of preppers are Republicans or conservatives or something in that vein. I came home from Iraq. I didn't jump right into the anarchy pool. I went libertarian first, which tends to, I think, be the natural evolution of a neocon conservative becomes a libertarian, becomes an anarchist, then eventually hits full on, you know, volunteerism. Um, And so I did the libertarian thing for a while and I realized, man, this is a very lonely place, you know, like (laughs) at least the Republicans and the Democrats have their tribes, libertarians. It's like, it's like watching nutless squirrels on leaf raking day, not know what to do. You know, it's, it's, there's no concerted effort to do anything. And so then my friends started asking me hardline questions, you know, well, if this is okay here, why isn't it okay here? Where's the line? Which made me realize even libertarianism isn't completely consistent. Right. So, and this was in my angry early thirties where, you know, I launched the B 52 F bomber every time I got onto Facebook and, you know, I was like, you know, F the police, F the military, F that. I was just angry, you know, and it didn't go over well with some of my good friends in the preparedness world. So I had to learn to dial it back a bit. The whole time this is happening, I'm working for a Republican member of Congress, by the way. Wow. And so I'm kind of a high profile person in the local uh, political arena because I'm going to all these events for her. I'm staffing her. I'm taking her to and from things. Bless her heart. She didn't care. I was good enough at my job where she said, you just do you, boo. And she never once questioned. She didn't tell me to shut up. She didn't ask me to do um, this or that. She just let me do my job and left me alone. So her and I are still friends. But yeah, there was definitely some rifts early on um, um, between the conservatives and the prepping community and folks like me. I'd like to say that over time, what I've noticed is a lot more people have kind of tended to go more libertarian, even if they don't use the term. Mm -hmm. I think that the neocon level of conservatism is being shed. And I think after what we saw from 2020 on, I think we've seen a concerted effort on the part of even conservatives not to necessarily be so thin blue line ish or thin green line or any of that. They're starting to even question their own, you know, their own belief systems, which is a good thing. So it was weird at first, but I've always kind of tended to be true to who I was and I'm still here. They say gradually, 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 and then all at once. Right. Right. Yeah. So that must've been, yeah. Okay. And the prepper end of things, did that, was that just a a natural outgrowth of military or where Um, did that come from? That started, uh, my dad was air force. So I grew up in Europe during the cold war, um, which wasn't nearly as cold. Hey, what's (laughs) up Meeks? Meeks is an old friend of mine. Uh, I'll I'll tell that story here in a bit because that was a very odd time portion of my portion of my life as well. But uh, which is consequently why I left Facebook and she knows this story. Um, But no, my dad was Air Force. So I grew up in Germany, was in France, a few other places growing up as a kid. I was born in North Dakota over the missile silos. My dad ended up retiring from South Dakota where the B-2 Lancer was at the time. And uh, so I always had that European... Uh, Cold War mentality, you have a transformer in your house, you have some food set back, all this sort of stuff. Um, And when I left home, having grown up in a super conservative, super, super religious home, um, in concepts like, you know, the end of days, you know, revelations, the Illuminati, all that sort of stuff was hinted at growing up, which always kind of had... uh, Yep made my mindset gravitate towards preparedness. And then when I became that freelance mercenary back in the late nineties, it became very obvious. I needed to have safe houses and caches of stuff hidden in different places. And then that metamorphosized after nine 11, really into the, the full, the full blown preparedness mindset. That makes sense. And then you've eventually, because you know, some people, I don't know, they homesteading and preparedness and prepping, they kind of go hand in hand, but a lot of people come, from one end or the other. So how did you, 
Uh, how did you get into uh, freesteading and lifesteading and homesteading? You, you, what I did in the army towards the end, I was a platoon sergeant. So I was in charge of like 45 soldiers and a handful of medics and a bajillion bucks worth of Humvees and guns and all that kind of stuff. So you become very logistically minded at that point. And you start to realize you can only stack so much rice and so much beans before you've just invited scurvy into your bunker. And then you start realizing, <laughs> Oh God, a bunker is a horrible damn choice. You know, you, you, you have to divorce the military mindset to become an adequate prepper. I think, uh, because a lot of the army guys and the Marine guys who are preppers or bunkers, I want all the army gear. I want camo netting everywhere, sandbag walls. And I'm like, oh, eh, that doesn't really work, man. You got to kind of logistically look past all of that. You can have that, but you have to have more. And so that eventually starts to um, morph into, okay, well, then I really need to start growing my own food. And when you first start growing your own food, you realize you throw away 80% of it because you don't know what the hell to do with it. Right. And it's going bad quicker than your family can eat it. And you're like, what am I supposed to do? So then you get into the canning and then you get into preserving and some folks get into freeze drying. And then it just kind of snowballs from there. And it's like, well, I like the fact I'm not spending money at Walmart on my carrots and onions anymore. So I'm going to get some chickens or I'm going to get some ducks. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, my eggs taste way better than that frozen shit that I got from, you know, Kroger or whatever. So then you're like, well, maybe I can raise something bigger and you and your buddies get together and have a horrible idea to make a, a pig pen out of, you know, some T posts and a, <laughs> some chicken wire. Oh God, that's a mistake. But when you battle through that first year and all of a sudden you have your first big animal that you've slaughtered and processed, it's the best tasting pork you've ever had, you know? So it's, it's just kind of that progression, one domino hitting the next. Um, and of course I had a lot of really smart people along the way to give me advice and to tell me how I was failing. And I had a lot of failures that absolutely taught me plenty of ways not to do things. And so, yeah, the, the progression from prepping to homesteading should be natural. It really should be. Do you remember, <clears throat> not to put you on the spot, but do you remember any in particular failure that was really miserable? <sighs> not knowing what you're doing with large livestock before you decide to try your hand at it. So when you raise pigs, there's some of the smartest animals on the damn planet. And I'll tell you what they, they are, they are vindictive and they are spiteful and they are angry because they know they're being raised for bacon. They know that shit. <laughs> yes, head. they do. So every chance they can to test your fences, they will do. And so the, the, what's the saying, build your pig enclosures, horse high, pig strong. Right. And so, it took us forever to get to that point. Um, and so pretty much, uh, I don't know how many times we had to repair fence. I don't know how many times we chased a damn pig or a cow that got out of, uh, of an enclosure because we just didn't know what to do. And so luckily we knew other homesteaders. Uh, and honestly, YouTube is a fit for all the things I hate about this platform, it, it is a wonderful place to get information for free. YouTube and Google have made the Department of Education 100% obsolete. Yep. You can learn anything you need to for free at your fingertips anytime. Just get away from you know the porn and TikTok and you'll find some pretty good stuff out there. So how, okay, so <clears throat> Midwest Preparedness um, Project, uh, what, you, it used to have a different name, did you say? Where was the genesis of this? How did it all come uh, together? Midwest Preparedness has always been Midwest Preparedness. I okay. was part of a, the expo that happened concurrently at the beginning, but it was its own thing. And then the Kansas Prepper Expo was its own thing. Um, in 2016, when our former president won election, um, it did seem like all of the white conservative Christian preppers all of a sudden stopped caring. Right. They, they had their hope. They, they had their man. And all of a sudden everything was right with the world and the sparkles and the farting rainbows came out. And all of a sudden the prepping movement took a nosedive in 2016. So that kind of killed the expo. So for a few years I went incognito, really didn't have much to do publicly anymore. I was still invited to go speak or talk somewhere at some point. But it was very rare, and I really didn't go out and make time for it like I did. I focused more on my house, my family, my hobbies. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, that's that, that's kind of how that happened. And then Midwest Preparedness was kind of going along uh, side on its own. And you had guys like Tag from Life Done Free. You had um, the Bug Out Channel, uh, some of the folks from EMP Shield, Patrick Henry. Uh, a bunch of those guys were kind of doing that over – 
on their own. And then after 2020, I got invited to come help with um, the Midwest Preparedness Project. And now I'm pretty much one of the directors who make sure that the shows go on as they should go. So what all, um, how much has it grown from when you started to what it is now? The very first one I helped with, I want to say, and don't quote me on this. Uh, Patrick <laughs> will tell me if I'm right or wrong on this one. I want to say the first one I went to was somewhere around 80 people, 80 to 90. Okay. Um, I got involved with Patrick and over the course of four shows, we've gone from that to 215 at this last one. Nice. Um, and we're not trying to super grow it terribly fast, terribly quick, just because we're kind of limited to, to the space we're at. So we've been at this army Corps ground out at Perry Lake in Kansas. It's supposed to hold 50 people. If that tells you anything. So, um, and, and you'll get to see that location this fall uh, if you uh, have the good graces to come visit us. I was going to say, I think, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, ne yeah, never, never actually stopped in Kansas other than maybe a bathroom break on the highway, you know, on the uh, interstate. But uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm rather excited to, you know, 99% come and visit <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> it's going to oh be a good gosh. time, man. It's going to yeah, be a good yeah. time. Yep. So, so what's. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say the Meeks made this comment says go free states. I was going to tell this story. Yes. Go for so, it. When I stopped working for Congress, I went to work for the state of Kansas through a federal organization called ESGR. It was just a mundane, logistically boring. Uh, it was just a job, right? I was just existing. So I got into this video game online called Fallout 76. And it's a online post-apocalyptic game. I love the Fallout games anyway. And Meeks and I and a few others ran a group called the Free States Militia. Now, this game came out, oh God, I don't even remember what year. It was. I think it was 2019, 2018. I don't remember what year it came out. Several years back. And the Free States Militia are a group in the actual game. They're a group in the game that right before China and the United States goes to war, they secede from the Union at Harper's Ferry in, um, in, in West Virginia. They build a series of private bunkers underground and they secede from the union and create a prepper compound. So yeah. this game being an online game, when I chose what group I was going to role play with and what group I was going to, so of course I picked the free States militia fast forward to uh, 2020 or 2019, 2019 when, uh, when, when the pedophile in chief, and the angry yam had their very first uh, debate, and <laughs> yep. and and the angry yam refused apparently to deny the Proud Boys right off the bat. Right, the very next day, Facebook launches this bullshit algorithm that swept up everything that was militia related and banned everybody from Facebook. Well, right. because we were the Free States militia, we got banned. Meeks got banned. I got banned. Uh, the, the other three leaders of the group got banned. And so we're like, what do we do? There was no recourse. There was no way to go through Facebook to appeal this. So we were all on Twitter at the time promoting the video game there. And so one of the CEOs at Bethesda Game Studios went to bat for us against Facebook behind the scenes and got us reinstated. So we get back on, we're playing. Now in this game, there's all kinds of stuff. And because it's an online game, there's an online economy. So like I was big into the economy. I, I ran auction pages on Facebook. I bought and sold and trade in the in-game currency, weapons, armor, all this stuff, right? Nerd shit, I know. Okay. But it was but it was fun. Well, 20 January 6 happens. Right. And of course, they launch another algorithm wrapping everybody up and we all got banned for a second time. Uh, because Facebook couldn't tell the difference between me on a video game page trying to sell an alien laser blaster and whether I was from ISIS trying to do actual arms dealing. So they banned us a second time. And at that point, I'm like, I'm done being spoken to like this from a bunch of nerds. Um, I'm, I'm done. And so I left Facebook uh, <laughs> at that point. I retreated to MeWe. Um, and that's where I still am. Then Freesteading came up and I'm there too. One step closer says Fallout games are awesome, especially New Vegas. Yes. New My Vegas son has been playing Fallout for many 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 oh. years it it's the one that has like 1950s music yep. for the soundtrack yeah he yep. loves yep. it yep i um i don't play a lot anymore video games but i don't um, either the last of us was the last one i worked my way through oh yes did you play that 
I played both. The first okay. game, in my opinion, is the perfect video game. It's the yes. one game that just, if you're a father, it sucker punches you in every possible way. Yeah, it does. The second game was amazing. If you had removed about three scenes of woke bullshit from it, it would have been per- another really good game. But it was, was still a- worth playing. Great was that the game. scene that it involved was at a golf club, wasn't it? Yeah, there was a golf. Well, that part I didn't mind. It was the it was the it was the intimate Other scene stuff. on the boat that okay. was a little bit too much. And then the end, it was like, God, how many times can you cut each other before you're just done? Like, come on. I Becky and I watched the show, uh, the one that awesome. just came on. It was so good. Oh, so good. <laughs> so and, good. Um, yeah, so but I haven't played the second game. I own it. I have never, I don't know if I'll make time for it, but it, everybody keeps telling me the same. It's worth it, but it's yeah. It, it's got some woke elements, um, but honestly, there you can overlook them if, sure. if you're willing to see it for the sequel. It was meant to be, you know. Ellie's character becomes kind of a whiny little bitch through the whole thing. She gets really petulant and un- unthankful. But other than that, it's 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 definitely worth playing. I, they they I, made the gameplay a lot more seamless. I can't that anyway. It oh. drives me nuts when you have an established character because you 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 kind of you take up to a character and you realize this this is who they are you have a character arc they have a a personality type and then they just swap it and it happens all the time and it's frustrating because anyway yeah here we are bitching about it but a couple of grown-ass men talking about video games and stuff games right yeah and that's part of why i just don't play anymore because i realized after three years of throw i was playing from nine o'clock at night till midnight one o'clock for three years and we were we were internationally known meeks is a voice actor Wow, uh, she's done voice acting in a lot of different uh, machinimas made from that game. Yep. Uh, another gal that was with us named Gamer Gal. She was also does voice acting. I did some voice acting. You can still go on YouTube and find all the machinimas we did with other groups. I mean, it was nerdy, but it was fun. But it sucked every bit of time I had, and I realized after three years, God, I've gotten fat, and I've been sitting on my ass for three years. It's time to get up and grow some more vegetables. So I did. And I just kind of flipped the narrative very quickly and went back to real life. That's cool. I don't begrudge anybody their hobbies at all, but that that's cool, man. Yeah, that that that's what I we were talking about baseball before we went live. And that's I, I had to decide. Mm-hmm. I was like, Blue Jays or content creation? And I right, you know, because 162 oh. games a year at three hours. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, I was an Atlanta Braves fan in 1992 and three. You and I would have hated each other. We did not get along very well. <laughs> I know. Oh man. You guys made up for it though down the road. You we know, did. You and you guys at least kicked the Phillies ass in 93. And since the Phillies beat the Braves, I felt vindicated. That oh, that was a good year. I, yeah. yeah, that was a good year. <laughs> so all right. So what what do you guys do at uh, Midwest Preparedness um, Project? What what's kind of the goal of it? We do as much as we can in a week period. So it's a Monday through Sunday thing. Uh, wow. The real meat and potatoes start really Thursday night and run through Saturday night. But we try to give you a little of everything. We try to make it where it's not vendor heavy. So there's going to be seven eight vendors. Okay. A few more people will pop some stuff up at their tent. Hey, I'm a free market anarchist. Do what you want. The prime real estate goes to the people who are the actual vendors. Um, so you'll you'll get to buy some ammo, buy some gold and silver, buy some freeze-dried foods, buy some tomahawks, some books, some medical stuff. All of that will be there. There will be an element of that. Um, there will be five classes this year, two on Friday, three on Saturday. Um, on Friday, we are introducing two new events this year, which I won't say yet because we're not putting out this quite yet. But I think you might be a part of one of those. Possibly. Sure. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> so there's that. And then on Saturday, we're going to have three classes and then we have a potluck and then we have a giveaway. So okay. basically I get a bunch of sponsors. They donate everything from guns to solar generators, to medical bags, to IFAX, all this stuff. And I sell tickets all week long and all of those proceeds go to build the next show. We don't make any money doing it. Um, we don't have a paycheck. So all that money gets accounted for. I take the money. Patrick holds the money. Um, That way there's a separation there. Um, And then after we do the giveaway, we have an event called Barter Town. Uh, Barter Town is an event that is historically done Saturday night. And the only two rules are nothing that will get you arrested and no fiat currency. So what will happen is we put these cage lights up all under this pavilion. And we run it off of a generator. 
and everybody comes out, kids, adults, it doesn't matter. They put all their stuff out on these picnic tables and then they go around all night for like two hours swapping back and forth. Well, I've got this, you know, this package of uh, canning lids and you've got a Mora 511. You want to swap? Sure. And they swap. And that's what everybody does for about two hours. Uh, and the idea is to foster a sense of alternative economy. One thing TAG talks about a lot, one thing I talk about a lot, and a lot of the folks who, who do this is creating the counter economy, creating the gray market. And the idea is if tomorrow ESG is fully implemented and central digital banking currency is fully implemented, you will have to find a way to eat. You will have to find a way to do everything. All of us are going to have to participate to some degree. There's no getting around that. But if you can remove as many things as you can, that would force you to participate further in those, in my mind, antichrist systems, then you're freer than the people who rely completely on those electronic systems. And the problem with barter right now is so many people have grown up 100% of their lives under the dollar that in their mind, they'll say, okay, well, I bought this for 20 bucks. How <laughs> much did you pay for that? And that's what they use to barter. Um, I got a good buddy. His name is Hitch. Uh, he lives in our area too. And he talks about this a lot. He's like, look, man, I might have a whole package of seeds here, but there's 10 seeds in this baggie. And each of these seeds is going to produce a plant that'll produce a hundred more seeds. You have perpetual food in this one baggie. I don't care if you paid 20 bucks for this. This baggie is not worth that knife. One seed is worth that knife. And he tries to get you to think about bartering and trading from a perspective away from the dollar. So that real value is used in barter, not just perceived monetary value. And that's really what Barter Town is all about, is to start training people, especially the kids. Because well, all of us, especially guys like me who help run this show, we're wasted by that time. We're so <laughs> tired. We're done. We're, we're like two whiskeys in at that point. And I don't want to barter anymore. I've, I've been up on the stage. I'm seeing this thing. Patrick's been up emceeing this thing. You know, Christy, our youth coordinator, has been wrangling everyone's kids for three days. We're done. So we give all of our kids our stuff, and they run out there, and they do all the bartering. And so our kids are going to be a step ahead when those horrible systems are implemented, you know, with trading with other people. Those, you know, um, I, I grew up, I used to work for a guy who ran a, a used music and bookstore. And uh, before I got married on Saturday mornings, he'd pick me up way too early for my young ass, and we'd go out yard sale. And he would, you know, there were times where he'd be like, you know, Tim, that's a fair price and I'm going to pay it. But I, I learned more from that dude on how to barter and how to dicker. And people, it's a lost art, isn't it? Uh -huh. It is. Especially, like I said, you're married to whatever, like you guys are probably married to the Canadian dollar. We're married to the American dollar. So it's hard to see value past what the inflated market will show. You know, right. and, and the real market is inflated. It's, it's, it's run by the rules of inflation, deflation, stagnation, and all that, whereas barter is literally use for use. And so it's a completely different mindset. So what does the real free market mean to you? What is that concept? Because I, I, it's coming out here where we're talking about it, but I'd like to, we might as well, we got time. Let's talk sure. about it. The real free market is best described to me as 100% regulation free. Um, as a libertarian anarchist, I would describe it as gay married couples should be able to have unregistered machine guns that are fully automatic to guard their pot fields. And that's going to offend everybody, and I don't give a shit. But if you think about what I just said, it's not just the buzzwords. It's the whole thing, right? So you want to bring pot seeds? Bring pot seeds. I don't give a shit, right? It's none of my business. Now, right. obviously, we can't allow that because we're on core ground. But in a perfect world, bring pot seeds, bring your moonshine, bring bullets, bring guns, bring silver, bring fruit and vegetables from your garden, from your trees, bring your own meats. And the thing is the free market will decide what the value is. And the free market will also determine who is trusted and who is not. If you have canned meat and every time someone trades with you, they get sick, no one's going to trade with you, which means you then have to get better or you go broke. Real actual market principles. There's no bailouts. There's no federal buy-ins. There's no federalization. There's none of that shit. It's if you suck, you're going to suck. If you're good, you're going to get good. And if you suck, you have to learn to become good. And if you're good, you have to maintain that and not get cocky and think you can just ride the wave. It forces everybody to be a little more excellent, a little better than they were the day before. And it takes all the safety nets away. All of them. They're gone. In a, in a true free market, there is no safety net. If you decide to take a bunch of people's money and invest it and you screw up, they're going to lynch you, plain and simple. 
right? Metaphorically speaking, of course, sure. but, but you get the point, right? It's a free market is the wild West. It is chaos. It is anarchy. It is all of these things, but it's free. And I would much rather deal with the free market where I can handle the one or two people that try to cheat me in my own way than have to rely on a litigant system that 18 months later, I might get half my money back from some court. If you know, the person I'm suing has the money to even pay back. But, but, but there's always, but, you know, everybody always wants to, everybody, you know, liber, doesn't matter, libertarians, liberals, uh -huh. conservatives, everybody wants to slide a butt in there. But sure. But what happens if, but what, you know, I, so are there exceptions? Uh, for me, no. Right. That, that's not the for me, not I for know. my children. No, I, I don't believe in exceptions. I believe if you're going to hold a position, you have to hold it ubiquitously and universally. And the minute you start making exceptions, it means somewhere in the back of your mind, you doubt your own shit. You know, if, if you're willing to say, yes, free market, except then that means you don't believe in a free market. It means you believe in a regulated market, albeit smallly regulated. And that's where I would differ with even, you know, big L party libertarians is I don't believe in any regulation at all. Not one damn bit. And that's, yeah, I, I, I think it's Jack that says, uh, what's the difference between a libertarian and an anarchist is like three years, you know, three years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's not wrong. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that's. That was, you know, and, and that's where I came in too. You know, I kind of, I slid through the, I went from the, the right wing conservative into the libertarian and I'm like, ah, you know, that's not what I, yeah, no, I see. I, and that, that's the ones that get stuck in that libertarian mindset. It's tough because every, all they want to do is argue about the exceptions. Right. Right. Oh, oh uh, sure. Roads, government, or uh, sorry, roads, um, you know, defense schooling, or military or school, or healthcare, defense, all of it. Right. Right. I, it, uh, I'm up here in Canada and I deal with it and people, you know, I'll talk about, it. I'm like, you know, I, I would be totally happy with doing away with all taxation tomorrow. And they're like, but healthcare, I'm like, dude, do you know how much I can spend? Do you know what kind of insurance I could get for the money I spend on uh -huh. you know, or for the taxes that are stolen from me? So all that government is, is a way to make people docile and, and lazy. And when they're docile and lazy, they're manageable and people don't understand that. Sure. It's really nice to wake up and not have to worry about where you get your health insurance from. And it was, it's probably very nice to wake up and not worry about where your food comes from because you get EBT or food stamps. And it's probably very nice to have an Obama cell phone. I'm not going to lie. It'd probably make my life a lot fucking easier, but the easiest road is often the road that's going to get you the most hemmed up. You know, it, it's the easy road that leads to the complacency, which is why we are literally still sitting here. Nothing's been done about the fact, you know, I don't know how, how far I can press this topic, but you're probably okay. The government all but admitted this year, they <laughs> killed president Kennedy and no one's done a damn thing about it. Why? Because they're comfortable because they have their air conditioning because they have their processed foods and they have their market where they can go and get their, their Ritalin and their, and their SSRIs and their, and their, and their, uh, diabetes medication, right? You know, it's, everything is just handed to you. You just got to walk up to the, a, a different counter, scan your card and get your goods. It's, it's comfortable. And I totally understand that. But man, the minute it gets turned off, that comfort is going to come crashing down around you like a plate glass window. And you won't know what to do. You're beholden at that point. And of course, you know, we, <clears throat> one of our businesses, we are very much, intertwined with governmental things and that's the nature of what we do and you are 100 and you can imagine i'm anyway but it is what it is but oh yeah you are 100 percent beholden on certain things and you know it's it's the whole please sir could i have some more goose mindset because it right what it is it 100 sure. you know and if they, <clears throat> if they shut it off tomorrow well we we would just do something different we're cool with that but it you're beholden and the people who that's their only their only livelihood or their only means of gain. Oh my God. I would be <laughs> sick to my stomach 24 seven. Why do you think it is? You can have perfectly good people don certain costumes, take certain jobs who are just as lower middle class as the rest of us who will be absolutely happy to beat the shit out of you on the corner of a street because they're just following the law. Right. We watched this in Australia during 2020. You had big, giant, burly police officers on camera saying to the protesters, we agree with you, but I have to feed my family. 
That's the exact reason why government is antichrist. That is the most absurd mentality you can have, where you see the right thing, but you're unwilling to do it because of some porridge. That is, you know, I, uh, so I, I, I don't know if I ever told you this or not, but I, I actually went to, uh, my university education was in religion to be a pastor at oh, one time. Yep. And that, one of my most influential um, professors was uh, Mike McNeil. And okay. he always said that a person has to, he, he said, what you believe and what you do can only be different for so long. You right. either have to change your actions or your beliefs to line them up because you can't live in that mental dissonance for too Correct. long. Correct. And it, yeah. yeah, that right. And there, how do you do it? Where, where where do they? How do they keep doing it? The only way to break free is to allow yourself pain. We have become so conditioned in the West to believe that pain is bad, that suffering is bad. Every progressive liberal policy and the progressive conservative policies all aim to alleviate suffering. And we don't seem to remember that suffering is the great teacher. It is the great benefactor. Suffering is a wonderful thing because through suffering, you learn how to independently handle things. But when everyone does it for you, when you have these massive superstructures that are provided by the state, by the church, by corporations, whatever, you don't have to suffer. You might have a few months where your electricity bill gets, you know, sent to collections. Oh God, what a Western problem to have, right? <laughs> um, you might have some times where you have to buy more ramen and less chicken. Oh God, what a Western problem to have, you know, but it's still nothing. That's still mitigatable. I was poor as shit when I was 18 years old. I was eating tuna helper without the tuna. You know, I was, <laughs> I was on the ramen noodle diet, but at any given point, I was living better than 90% of the world. Now, in the moment, I thought, oh, God, what was me? How bad can it possibly get? You know, I had no clue. I didn't have a clue. And so now the only way to shake free is to purposefully allow yourself to suffer. And that means sometimes you have to go hungry. And that means sometimes you force yourself to do things that are uncomfortable. You force yourself to do the harder method of doing things. You know, there are times I'll turn off all the lights in the kitchen and force myself to cook a meal by candlelight or just by maybe one light in the corner. Uh, and it sucks. You know, it's hard to read measuring cups that way. It's hard to read instructions on the back of a box that way. It's hard to do anything that way. But you force yourself to do it. Uh, in the wintertime, once in a great while, I'll make myself walk barefoot to the mailbox in the snow. And it sucks. It hurts. I walk barefoot in my yard most of the time and I have to walk across gravel, which is not comfortable. And I get stung on the bottom of my feet by bees at least once or twice a year. Cause I don't spray my yard. I like, I like the bees. So, you know, I get stung by them and it sucks and it hurts. But through that, you learn to be more observant of the world around you. You learn to pick your steps. You learn to walk more carefully. You learn what to carry, when to carry it how much to carry. You learn mm -hmm. how to save your steps and not have to run up and down the steps 18 times when you could have just done it three times. And you measure your decisions. You know, one of the things I always say is that every decision in life is an economic decision. And so many people don't understand that when I first tell them. But then you let them know economics doesn't mean just money. It also means time. It means energy. It means emotions. It means physical goods, mental whatever. And every time you do something, you're giving something and you're getting something in return. And if you don't learn how to balance your life or that tends to meet up in the middle somewhere, then you're going to either be completely exhausted or completely poor. And those are your options if you don't learn how to balance. Have you ever read Ayn Rand? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because that, that's her, that 100%, that's her mindset, you know, her, her yes. philosophy, objectivism. I mean, all, all relationships are, are a... Uh, really an economic relationship you know yep. you're you're in you're in every relationship for what you can get from it and some people will say that's evil well no that that is that that's the free market that's that's anarchy that you know that is all of that yep rolled up into one and at the individual level because you know what do they say the ultimate minority is is the individual and the individual right which is why you know that the political left is so a bunch well, of liars yeah. they claim to be for the minority except for the smallest one you know when you when you said that um we're not uh being uncomfortable or pain is is the key to learn that kind of to roll it back into uh, bartering i was thinking you know when you barter with somebody that is an uncomfortable proposition it because is. there's they could say no right yep. you know when i make 
I do it all the time. Actually, I, somebody I met the other day, he said, you know, um, we were talking about this property I was looking at buying. He said, I made the majority of my money from insulting offers. And oh, I, wow. If that's not a great, he said, you know, I might've made, you know, dickhead offers to 30 people and got three of them. Right. Yeah. And so the, the bartering is the same thing for our kids or anybody. We don't necessarily, we're not cool with being uncomfortable. So we don't even bother bartering, but the more right. you embrace it, you know, I, yeah, I, that's why so when many I, people get taken advantage of at car dealerships and things of that nature because they just right. don't know how they don't know how to haggle. They don't know how to look out for themselves, you know. And sure, it'd be great to live in a world where you could just go to a car dealership and that's the price and you pay it just like you would a toaster or a CD or a video game or a pair of socks. But that's not how it works. When you buy cars and houses and big ticket items, you got to know how to watch out for yourself because those people only make one sale a month, so they're looking for a good one. You know, it's not like the guy selling socks; he's going to sell a million pairs a month again economic decisions. So can you elaborate a little more on that? I love the idea, but the, the fact that every decision is an economic decision. Okay. Probably well, one of the more unpopular ver uh, things to talk about in that arena, but probably one of the most honest ones is, is love and a relationship, a man and a woman. It's an economic dance. What do you bring to the table? Well, what do you bring to the table? And then it gets into the real gooey stuff of what are you willing to do? Well, what are you willing to do? And over the course of a year, two years, you figure all this stuff out. You know, starts out in the movie theater. Are you able to put your arm around her on the first date? Nope, nope. All right, that that's a no. You know, can I hold her hand? Okay, she went for that, right? But it's a dance all the way through. And everything you do with your spouse or your mate or whatever, it is a give and take back and forth. You know, in any relationship where it's all one way or the other is very unhealthy. Kind of like the super poor and the super rich. It's very unhealthy. So... Everything else in that relationship is a give and take. Where do I get to put my toothpaste and toothbrush when I move into your house? Do we buy a house together? Do we buy it separately? Do we keep our last names or do we hyphenate or do we you know, go the traditional route? Do we have both of our names on the bank account? Do we have separate bank accounts? Is it your money, my money, and then a little bit of ours? Is it all ours? It's all an economic dance. Every damn part of it, whether it's the monetary portion, the sexual portion, the emotional portion, all of it is a dance. And it's all give and take. And the more someone's willing to give, honestly, you should be willing to give and back and forth. And, when, and then you learn boundaries where people aren't willing to go in any of those categories. And you have to learn to respect that the same way you have to learn to respect that when that guy tells you that the socks are $2.99 a pair, you got to pay $2.99 a pair. I mean, that's really the heart and soul of it. What do you say to the person that says, well, <clears throat> if you're only in it for yourself, you're never going to help anyone else? I'd say it's the exact opposite. You can't possibly be of any good to anybody if you abuse the shit out of yourself and don't allow yourself to be properly edified spiritually or emotionally or any of it. If you're just ragged, if you're just some monk flagellating yourself with a whip all the time and crawling upstairs on your knees through broken glass, what, what good are you? Hmm. You're in pain. You're, 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 you're losing blood. You're bleeding out on the steps. What good can you possibly do? to give somebody counsel or give somebody, you know, um, the, the love that they need or the support that they need. How can you possibly bear someone else's cross? If you haven't learned to bear your own, you have to look out for yourself. Cause if you don't look out for yourself, you are in no, your car out there. If you just leave your car out there for eight months and don't do anything to it, and the tires start to dry rot and the end and the engine oil starts to leak and, and the headliner starts to fall down. When you finally get in the car to drive it somewhere, it's probably going to break down on you. You're the car, so you can go out and make sure you drive it every day, make sure the wheels are rotated, make sure you're checking your brakes. Self-care is every bit as important as care for others, and that's also an economic decision. Are you willing to invest time into your own life? Are you willing to invest time into yourself so that you can be better for everybody else? So it's okay to both make money and help people? Yes. You can't help people without money. I'm sorry, you just can't. And by money, I don't necessarily mean fiat, but I mean, sure. you, have to, you have to have something tangible to help Value. out. You know, you, you can only get so far in hopes and prayers, you know, and, and, and I am in, and I'm a Christian and I'll tell you, I believe in hopes and prayers, but you can only get so far on that. You know, you, you can only, that does really good at keeping yourself at a mentally healthy place, but it doesn't do anybody else any good. If all you ever do is hopes and prayers, you know, the Bible says faith without works is dead. It's the same, it's the same prognosis. If, 
all you're going to do is tell people in a text, well, I'll keep you in my, in my thoughts. Well, what good are you really doing them? Okay, cool. Can you come help me change this tire? Nah, bro. I got, I got a barbecue to go to. Sorry. You know, you're not really putting any feet to what you're doing. Do you have a hard time marrying Christianity and anarchism? Nope. Nope. I think- I think you elaborate because I go, I mean, I've had many conversations with many people on this topic and since you brought it up, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on how they come together. Faith in whatever God you believe in is a personal choice. It doesn't get much more anarchist than that. Now, when you bring in established religion, that's when you start to have problems, right? Because religious camps end, end up being states of the, of their own, Right. But if your personal relationship with your God is just that and you use it to make your life better and you allow it to make your life better and you humble yourself and you are willing to take life lessons from the things that you read in whatever book you read, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to read or what to do. It it doesn't get any more anarchist than that. You know, I I view the Bible as a as a series of um um, allegories and stories that are designed to teach me a deeper truth. For example, let's take the story of Jonah and the whale. At the end of the day, when I end up before God, whatever that looks like, is he going to care if I believe that Jonah was a literal person who got swallowed by a fish because he decided not to do what God told him to do? And somehow, after meeting God, thought he gets on a boat and somehow getting on a boat will take him away from God. Is he going to care if I take that literally or is he going to take or, or will he care that I gleaned the greater message of when the divine calls on you to do a task, you do it. And if you don't, you get thrown down into the depths of despair and then only through repentance and finally meeting the goals in life that were set before you, will you find self-fulfillment? I, I look at it very much in the same way that uh, Jordan Peterson does. Um, and he does a, an entire amazing series on the Old Testament. Um, where he he goes into the deeper meaning of a lot of these different stories, right? Um, But look at the life of Christ as portrayed in the Bible. He overturned the tax collectors and he overturned the the money changers in the temple. He didn't tolerate it. He didn't just say, well, they're just doing their jobs. And well, if I have nothing to hide, I should just obey the law. He didn't do that. He made a ruckus everywhere he went. He fought the religious establishment everywhere he went. He was contrary to the state. In fact, there's a very, very good um, book out there by a guy, I think his name is James Watts, and it's a book entitled Taxation is Slavery, a Libertarian Case for Christianity, or a Christian's Case for Libertarianism. And he goes through and he shows how most Western Christian churches have been misinterpreting most of the messages found in the New Testament for a long time basically after the 50s when evangelicalism kicked in and turned everything into a giant commercial you know but he he systematically goes through you know portions of the old new testament and he'll show you why it is taxation is slavery and the actual relationships that were spoken about and, and how taxation was always seen as something you couldn't avoid so you did it not to die basically very good book and i encourage everybody to read it so of course, we, we both grew up, um, sounds like very similar households. And that's a lot of where my, uh, you know, end of the world mindset and prepping came from was that 80s evangelical end of the world, you yeah. know, hey, Sunday oh, night. Let's watch. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what was it, Thief in the Night? Did you ever see Thief in the Night? Oh, yes. Oh, nice that scared smile. the shit out of me as a kid. Oh. So, okay. So <clears throat> when you have the modern evangelical mindset, or you've been around it Mm -hmm. and then, but you personally are an anarchist and I I would assume you ascribe to biblical morality at that point, or, you know, most of it. How do you separate that from the need to enforce that on other people? I have no need to enforce it on other people. I understand. I I, I know that's where you're from. Yeah. Um, At no point does Christ tell the disciples to go beat people into submission. He just says, go tell them the word. It's up to them to choose it. It's up to them to accept it. And at certain places where they didn't accept it, the disciples left. You know, Jesus, yeah. Jesus left certain cities that didn't accept his message. Didn't call down fire and brimstone. In fact, his disciples asked him to, but he wouldn't do it. So you don't need to, you know, spend your entire life, um, you know, pushing for certain legislation to get passed. No, because 
here's the thing about legislation, and this is where the American Christian Church has gone so absolutely asinine, in my opinion. The minute you grant the government the power to do mm-hmm. something, because in the moment you think it's a good idea, it means you've now perpetually granted the government the right to do that no matter who's in charge. Here's an example. I have a friend who's um, more left-leaning, but he's a very intelligent guy. We get along very well. We talk all the time. And we were having a conversation one time about – and this was post-January 6th. And, of course, he's Democrat. Um we're talking about January 6th. We're talking about, he was complaining, I think about uh, us. Uh, he was in a car with someone and he witnessed a, a police officer um, racially profiling somebody. And this guy's not, you know, an extremist at all. He's not someone who's emotionally given to just jumping on the bandwagon. So if he tells me that's what he saw, I tend to believe him. Sure. And so the, the topic of gun rights came up and I'm like, look, man, I understand that a lot of people think that, you know, we have to start doing this and that to curb gun problems, but here's what you're missing. And here's what everybody's missing right now. You have your president in power. He's like, yeah, I said, so you probably have no problem with your president, your team telling everyone else you can only own product a under this set of guidelines, you know, licenses, background checks, whatever, right? Whatever, whatever the logistical minutia might be. And he said, yeah. And I said, well, what happens when Trump comes back? And he's like, what do you mean? I said, well, if, if you're okay with the current president um, doing this and making these rules and, in, and enforcing this rule, you're basically giving permission to the other side to do it too. You're only going to be in power for eight years, buddy. In this <laughs> country, with the exception of the Reagan Bush era, everything's been eight years, you know, for the most part, you know, back and forth, at least, even if it was only four or that one case where it was 12, it still goes back and forth. The other team always comes back at some point. That's how the American system is, is devised. It's an illusion of choice, right? <laughs> yep. And uh, he's like, well, I've never thought about it that way. I said, yeah, the, the problem with all these good ideas that everyone has that they want to use the state to enforce, you're basically leaving that framework in place for the next team and the next guy. And what happens if I, I said, you're a Democrat. Do you like every Democrat? Well, no. Well, have there been Democrat presidents you didn't like? Yeah. Well, would you want him to have that power? Well, not necessarily. So why are you implementing it now? And he's like, I never thought about that. I said, look, man, after 2016, it wasn't the Republicans talking about homeschooling and gun rights. It was the Democrats. The minute mm-hmm. Trump won office, all of a sudden, all these you know, left-wingers were like, I want to homeschool my kids. I'm going to pull them out of public education because that gal Trump put in place was unpopular. You know, I need to get guns. The John Brown Gun Club emerged, you know, where all these lefties were out there trying to shoot guns and train. I'm like, see what I mean? Now that it's not your guy, all of a sudden you guys think that these things are good ideas. And if you had your way under the previous administration, you'd have banned all this stuff and you wouldn't have access to it now that you think you need it. And that's why I think that it's very easy to square Christianity with, with anarchism, because at no point does Christ tell the disciples to lobby the Roman Senate. At no point does he tell them to run for office. At no point does he tell them to go join some, you know, Jewish super PAC or some you know, <laughs> Antioch, Antioch Christians for who for for whatever insert the blank candidate. None of that exists in, in the in the in the in the New Testament or in the Old Testament for that matter. It doesn't exist. So. If he's willing to exist in the world of the Romans and the Pharisees and not advocate for political change, why the hell should I? Appreciate that. I like that a lot. That's good to hear. I love hearing that. Act. I, I spent a lot of time discussing with family years ago that, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the evangelical push to change laws could be turned around and used against them very quickly. Yep. And we, we saw that in the over the COVID, you know, here uh-huh. in Canada. Certain churches decide to stay open, and guess what? They got the Gestapo and uh, fences put around their building. Right. So mm-hmm. it can just, you know, it it might take a little while for that yeah. pendulum to swing. But you are, that's the, you know, it's all good and you know all fun when your guy is in right. Office, when you're you know, in charge, everything's fine, you know. And, but that's the, I really do appreciate that about the American mindset as well. You know, you guys view your rights as inherent or God given. They, just because you wrote them down doesn't make it right. any more powerful. They just exist, right? right. And, sure. Yeah. Huh. If, if the Constitution incinerated in a fire tomorrow, I'd still own guns and I'd still do whatever the hell I want to do. You know, it wouldn't matter. So what are people going to... Uh, let's slide back because we're, well, we're going up on an hour now anyway. So let's slide back to the Midwest preparedness. Mm-hmm. And So what? 
How do people find you? How do they get there? What do they expect? You know, what's it cost? Yeah. That kind um, of stuff. Midwest preparedness project.com. Yeah, it's long, but it's the name. Sorry. It works. MWPP was already bought and paid for and we couldn't use it. So Midwest preparedness project.com. You can find us on freesteading. You can find us on MeWe. You can find us unfortunately on Facebook. Sorry, none of you will leave it. So we have to be there. Um, you can find us on Twitter or whatever it is now X. Um, you can find us on both YouTube and rumble. Um, just look up Midwest Preparedness Project. Uh, the logo is a white circle with an arc in the middle, and it says Midwest Preparedness Project. Pretty simple to find. Um, as far as cost, it's free. We don't charge you anything to get into Midwest Preparedness Project. Knowledge should be free, and so we give it to you for free. Um, the only way that we make money, at least currently, is through the sale of prize tickets that we start selling uh, Thursday afternoon, and we'll sell it all the way through Saturday evening, $5 a ticket or 5 for 20 um, we're going to actually break up the giveaway this year. We're going to do one portion of it on Friday night. And then, and because we found over the last few years that some people would only show up for a Thursday, Friday, they couldn't be there Saturday. So they missed out. So essentially Friday night, we're going to do a first round of drawings and then all the tickets that didn't win get left in the hopper and they're still there for Saturday night. And I'll sell tickets right up until the minute that it, uh, that the, we start drawing numbers because that's how we fund all of this. And it's getting to the point we have to fund it. You know, we have to bring in Porta Johns and we have to bring in, you know, tents and we have to bring in this and that. There's a lot of logistics to a show like this. And a lot of people don't understand just how much work it is to put on a festival. It is a lot of work. Uh, luckily, we have a very good crew. Um, I'm going to do some shout outs here. Uh, Nowhere Homesteady. Go look him up on YouTube. Um, he does a lot of e-bike stuff and some prepping and homesteading stuff. Um, good friend of mine, he donates his trailer every year. So we get to use his trailer to build the stage on. Then we have a guy named Hancock. He brings in solar panels and runs all of our electricity. Then we have a guy named Todd who comes out and he gives us all the mics and the mic stands and the soundboard and the speakers. And it's just on and on. Then we have a guy named Kevin who donates a lot of time and resources to helping to get all the little things we need to put on the show. Then his wife, Christy runs kids events. All the kids have stuff to do generally throughout Friday and Saturday. That way the adults can attend the adult classes. Some of these events involve the adults coming in and actually spending time with their kids because we like promoting the concept of family. Um, and that's one thing that does set us aside from a lot of these shows is we allow children. We allow all of that. You know, We don't try to make it where it's just an adult um, event because then you're missing half the people at that point. So we make it very family friendly. Um, camping and RV spots are first come first serve, show up when you can claim your spot. Some people show up on Monday, claim their spot, and then they don't come back till Thursday. That's fine. Uh, we're not going to get in the habit of telling people what to do there. Um, at least not yet until it becomes <laughs> ridiculous. Um, like I said, classes all day, Thursday classes all, I'm sorry, Friday and Saturday classes. We have a giveaway both days, barter town on, uh, on, on Saturday. We're introducing a new um, event on Friday, and it's kind of like Barter Town, only it's very specific. It's a seed exchange put on by Grumpy Acres Farm. Nice. I don't know if you've seen Grumpy Acres Farm before on YouTube. You should go check out their channel. They do freeze-dried foods, uh, root stimulator, some tools, stuff like that. But uh, they're good friends of ours, and they also tend to serve food throughout the thing. So you can um, uh, buy some food from them if you don't want to go to a gas station, whatever. Um so like I said, some vendors will be there to buy your essentials, some pretty cool stuff, and lots of knowledge, lots of friendship. We all sit around the campfire. Oh, I'm totally forgetting. On Friday nights, uh, we have a, a right after the giveaway, we have something called Preppers After Dark, and it's where we generally play conflicted um, around the campfire. And everyone crowds in around these campfires, and we play the game. Well, now that conflicted is going away, there's the new product called are you ready for the world without the rule of law? Dubrawl. This is put out by one of the guys who um, built the conflicted game back in like 2013. I think it was 2012, somewhere in there. He sent me some of the first decks. So I have two of these and we're going to play this and it's 10 decks of 30 cards. It's a much bigger product than conflicted. A lot more scenarios. Um, you can go find them on Amazon right now. If you look up, are you ready for Dubrawl? And um, we're going to use that this year. And it's going to be even better because they're brand new cards right after 15 years or 10 years or whatever it's been of using the old cards. Everyone's heard every card. So we have 
300 new cards to go through, which we'll probably only go through five or six because it takes you a while for everyone to kind of discuss through what each card scenario is at a time. But yeah, that's what it is. October 2nd through October 8th. So October 2nd is a Monday. We open the campground up, uh, come for a serve, and then starting really Friday morning is when all the big stuff happens with the classes and all that. Do people leave Saturday night or do they leave Sunday morning? Whatever they want. We just okay. have to be out of there by a certain time on Sunday. And generally Sunday, there's a small worship service that's held around the campfire for anybody who's inclined to attend. It generally is just a prayer and a quick devotional. You know, nothing big. We're not trying to turn this into a church or anything like that. But, but we certainly see faith as a pillar of preparedness. And so we allow those who want to partake in such events to absolutely do so. And then after that, we kind of, like you saw in the 80s, hands across America, we lined up and we walked the campground to make sure we leave it better than we found it pick up all the trash, all the stuff, and then we get the heck out of there and go home and crash for like 72 straight hours. <laughs> well, I can't wait. I, uh, yeah. I mean, if I were going to, you know, if I'm going to be there, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It'll be, it'll be a good, I'm, I'm looking forward to it for sure. So <laughs> that's great. How dare you? Oh my goodness. I, I have to get some props to stick them up, you know, as we get going. So yeah. I just wanted to shout out, we picked up, we, we usually don't have many viewers over on Twitch, but we got a new and mythical void over there. Just showed up at the end, but uh, we, we were just talking about, we wanted to know what we were talking about, and we are the Midwest Preparedness Festival, Anarchy, Free, free Market, the whole work. So, well, how do people, where do they find you, Spags? You can find my YouTube. It's called Spags Unfiltered. I'll probably offend everybody. Um, I really don't do much with it anymore. Um, I just don't have time to keep up with promoting myself um and honestly there's already a million dudes out there doing what i was doing and i'm just another voice in the wilderness and so i just kind of you know um you know I'm, I'm i'm i've lost interest very quickly in trying to be a youtube personality i get all my ego stroke that i need through the preparedness stuff here in kansas and missouri and even that i try to keep myself humble because ego is a is one of my sins and i know that so i try to keep that well under wraps it's not about me it's about the community it's about the community we're trying to build it's about the message of self-sustainability it's about the message of renewable everything including yourself and so at that point yeah if you want to go find me on youtube and rumble spags unfiltered if you want to be my friend on social media you got to go to MeWe or freesteading because i just don't do the other stuff facebook is run by people who want to kill you and so i see no purpose in being part of their algorithm driven poison i'm not making the money ever again so i know that not everyone can do that yet but if we all walked away from facebook today and all went to MeWe or all went to freesteading we absolutely could do it there's just no will people are still comfortable well thank you brother this has been a great conversation of course thanks for having you, me anytime you're welcome back anytime of course so if you want to hang in the back for a second i'll be sure. right back with you i'll close up and we'll be done all right. Sounds good. Thanks for coming by, everybody. Thanks, brother. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I wanted to get Spags on here to talk about the Midwest preparedness, but he has a lot to say and a lot of stories, and we'll have him back. We'll have him back another night, and we'll do a deep dive into anarchism and agorism and the open market and the whole works because he's a good dude. I can't wait to actually spend quality time in person with him. So support them. If you are within a day's drive of Perry, Kansas, come by that weekend or the week or whatever you want and uh, hang out with some like-minded folk, learn some stuff. And, uh, you know, there might be a guy from Canada there. Pretty sure you know how it is. So guys, with that, as always, stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week. <laughs>